from now on because I'm a pretty softly spoken person and they put these lights on which makes it a little easier too, at least for me and I'm grateful for that. It's great to look around and see everybody. I know a lot of people are visiting their family and a lot of people are sick in the world in which we're living in. There's no doubt about that. It's still popping around some of these crazy things but you know what? God is with us and that's what really matters and we have the Lord with us. It doesn't get any better than that. And I was thinking when we were singing that last song about the first time I heard that. I'll tell you where I was. I was in Albuquerque. I'll tell you more specifically where I was. I was at a cemetery. I'll tell you more specifically where I was. I was at a gravesite. And the woman who just sang beautifully sang that song a cappella at her mother's gravesite just before her mother's was, body was interned. And I had never heard it before. And it so caught me when it was my time to get up and say a few things, I could barely, barely speak. It just so took my breath away. And I can remember Stephanie and Katie would sing that song all the time together. When Katie went to heaven, that was one of the songs we played um, because it just reminded us of the important truth. In fact, our family sang together that day, that particular song. You may find that hard to believe at her service, but just because we wanted to reaffirm what we know is true that what God says is true, and it always can be depended on, and what he says not just about this life, but what he says about eternity is on the mark. Amen. It's absolutely on the mark. And you know what? We're living in a world where people need to hear a little bit more about heaven, and we're living in a world where people need to remember a little bit more about heaven, and so when the Lord was talking to me about what to share, and I asked him, he didn't have to pull me twice on this one, and there's no doubt about that. I am always excited to get up and share God's Word. Always excites me. But that's especially true this morning. It's not like this topic overwhelms everything else, but this topic does have a deep place within my heart. Every time we come together, I ask the Lord when we open up His, His Word that we would have a desire for Him to open up our hearts. Simply say that it's my hope that when we're together, we'll be able to see more than what our human eyes are able to see. It's my prayer when we're together, we'll be able to hear beyond human range. It's my prayer that we in our mind will be challenged to invite Jesus Christ to work in us and through us like never before. And again, we take this seriously. Pastor Jim and I both take this real seriously when we stand before it. So it's a very bold thing to say that you're going to share what the God of all creation put on your heart. But I can tell you the subject that the Lord has put on my heart, He really did. In fact, every week I share what I believe that God has put in my heart. But when He said to me, I'm going to give you a pull, I'm going to give you a tug today, and here's what you're going to be able to preach about. You're going to be able to preach about heaven. And I thought, well, Lord, you don't have to ask me twice on this one because this one I enjoy. So if you're here today, and the last few days have been hard for you. And sometimes they are when it's around the holiday. You're feeling a little, weir a little weary in your body. And humanly speaking, you're telling yourself or you're hearing from the evil one of your own human spirit that maybe you just can't press on. It's my prayer that after hearing what God promises for eternity, not just for a little while, you'd be able to press on and God would renew your vision. If you're here today and you're grieving and who at times doesn't miss people who who are not with us, even though we know someday we're going to be with them again up in glory, it's my prayer that you'll find comfort in the promises of God. If you're here today and you're looking around the world and you're seeing all the things that are going on that God told us would take place and you're feeling somewhat disillusioned, it's my prayer that you will recognize and be reminded that your labor in the Lord is not been given in vain. It goes with you. So here's the question. Are you ready? Are you ready to turn off the world for a little while? And turn on heaven for a little while. More importantly, turn on the one who is heaven. Because as much as I love the subject heaven, I love the one who made heaven real. The one who made heaven and promised heaven for us, and that's Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to get in the starting blocks of this particular journey by going with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Now, I've done some series on heavens, not so much in the pulpit, but in classes. Maybe if you're interested, let us know, and maybe we'll have this sometime in the new year. I don't know. But Luke chapter 10, if you're not familiar with Luke chapter 10, let me give you the, the setting. Jesus has sent out 70 people, and they went two by two. And they were given very special empowerment, and were given very special assignment. And when they came back and they were speaking with Jesus, they were telling them how excited they were to see all that took place. They were telling them about how they felt so empowered beyond themselves, how they were able to do things that they never could do. And the thing that seemed to amaze them more than anything else was the fact that even the spirits that were there, the evil spirits were there, were subject to them. And when Christ heard all that they had to say, he spoke back to them. Look what he says in verse 20. He says, however, however what? 
Do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Now, it would be great if all the bad spirits submitted to us, but that's not what to re ultimately rejoice in. What are we to ultimately rejoice in? He says, but rejoice that your names have been written where? That your names have been written down in heaven. Now, remember the, the setting for this particular section of Scripture. The 70 have been sent out on a very special mission, and they have been given very unique protection and empowerment, and they were very excited about everything that had taken place where they were gone. But when they reported back to Jesus and said, these are all the things that happened, and we're excited to share with you all the things that took place, but most of all, we want to share with you how excited we were that even the demons were subjected to us. What did Jesus say? He said, here's the main thing you need to rejoice about. You need to rejoice. Rejoice that your name has been written down in heaven. If you write in your Bibles, I encourage you to underline those words. What's the greatest reason of all to rejoice? It's in the fact that if you're a Christian, you have your name written down in heaven. If you've had a time and place where you've asked Jesus to come into your heart as your personal Lord, not just Savior, but as your personal Lord and Savior, guess where your name is written? Not just here on earth. Your name has been written down in heaven. Now I know what you know. You don't hear those words every day, so hear it one more time. What's the greatest reason of all to rejoice in this world is that this world is not all you're going to inhabit. The greatest reason of all is to rejoice that your name is written down in heaven. There's a few people who lived a long time ago, but they've had a dramatic effect on my life. I've listened to some of the things that they've said, and I've read a lot of their words. And one of the people who I've looked up to over the years was a man by the name of Dio Moody. Dio Moody didn't have much education. He had really poor grammar, and yet the Lord used him to change the world in a mighty way. He wrote a lot of books. I have a lot of books by him. And one of the books that he wrote was on heaven. And I want you to think about some of the words he said, and they're so important, I ask to put them up on the board. D.O. Moody wrote these words, and I quote him, I do not think it is wrong to think and talk about heaven. Amen to that. I would like to locate heaven. And I can tell you, I think I have a little idea where it is, and find out all I can about it. I expect to live there through all eternity. If I were going to dwell in any place in this country, if I was going to make it my home, I would want to inquire about that place, about its climate, about the neighbors I would have, about everything, in fact, that I could learn concerning it. That makes total sense to me. I tell people who are thinking about moving, maybe you should go check it out for a while. You're talking about getting a different job, maybe you should be there for a while and walk around and see how everybody treats everybody. If you're going to be someplace for a little while, it's important to still know something about it. But what's the most important place you're going to be forever if you know Jesus? Heaven. And you ought to find out all about it that you can. Another man who I appreciate so much. He's written so many things that I so, so deeply appreciate. It was a man by the name of C.S. Lewis. You may know of him. He was a great professor. And he was one who had said, I'm going to wipe out Christianity. I'm smart enough to do that. And anybody who wants to talk about Christianity, I'm going to let them know that it's not true. Well, he became one of the greatest apologists or, or defenders of the faith that there was. And I love what he had to say about, his heaven, about heaven. And I want you to listen to his words with not just your ears, but I want you to listen to his words with your heart. We're going to put this up on the screen, too. He writes, quote, for us. This is the end of all the story. Now, what's the us? It's talking about the people on earth. For us, the people on earth, this is the end of all the story. But for them, who are the them? They're the people who are in heaven. It was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world had only been the cover and the title page. And now, where are they? Where is he talking about? Those in heaven or at last beginning the chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, and in which every chapter is better than the one before. Wow, when I read that, my just, my just, um, it just shouts and whispers in my spirit. So let's really pray, and let's really dig in. Now, when I was a young pastor, I used to think the only difference between preaching and teaching was that you raised your voice a lot more when you were preaching. I don't know what the Lord's going to have me do. Um, I don't know what he's going to have me do any week. But this particular week, I really don't know what the Lord would do. So maybe a little bit of preaching, maybe a little bit of teaching, and maybe a combination of all things, and you may not even know what it was. But I will be using Scripture to share what we're talking about today. And I can tell you this much, I am prayed up, and I am excited, because we need to remember eternity. We need to take a longer look than the end of today, the end of next week, the end of the month, the new year. We need to look into eternity. If you know where you're going, 
and going to be for eternity, it has a dramatic effect on the life that you're living right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll dig in. Father, we've heard from the world all week. We've heard from the world all year. Father, some of the things we hear are encouraging. Some of the things we hear are discouraging. Sometimes the ones we hear are the, and are the most destructive to us are not other people, but even ourselves. We tell ourselves we can't. We tell ourselves we won't. We tell ourselves we're destined to just be, be down or discouraged or broken. Father, you have a plan for us. And you tell us we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. You tell us, Lord, that we can have power on this earth that is greater than what we can even begin to think. And you tell us, Lord, that one day all of our troubles and trials will pass away forever. Father, I pray that today, Lord, we really would put a, a shield on our heart, mind, and spirit when it comes to the things of this world and really try to understand what the scriptures teach about eternity. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you care enough to open up heaven's door for us forever. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we would walk in strong, that we would give you all we can, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. How do you even begin to talk about heaven? The Bible says this more than you can even imagine. How can you even begin to describe heaven when I haven't been there? I know people, a lot of people who have gone there. There's no doubt about that. And as I asked the Lord where I should begin, I was remembering a story that I, I heard a long, long time ago. It was a story about a little girl. And her mother was very desperately ill. And one day the doctor came over to the house. If you're as old as me, you remember doctors used to come to the house. And the family doctor, after examining the mother, wanted to go up to the little girl and start to prepare her for her mother's passing. Taking the child out for a little bit of a walk, he pointed to a big tree and then he very tenderly said these words, when all the leaves fall off that tree, your mommy will be taking her very long trip. About a week later, the physician returned, and on his way out of the house, he looked and he looked around for the little girl because he never saw her when he was in the house. He never saw her when he came out of the house, and then it happened. He saw her. Where was she? She was up in the tree doing her best to tie all the leaves to the branches. Who among us can't relate to that? The Bible clearly teaches that death is the enemy. It was never God's intention that we would die. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 26. He says, the last or the final enemy to be destroyed is death. Someday, if you're a Christian, this will be destroyed. And I'm going to say goodbye to you. Amen to that. Let's move forward to heaven. Listen now to the words of the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. He says, since the children have flesh and blood, he, who is the he he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus, too, shared in your humanity, so that by his death, Jesus' death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Have you known people who have been held in slavery by their fear of death. I have. One thing you get a, got to get over real fast, if you're a pastor, is your fear of death, because you're around that a lot. But we don't have to worry about that, because we're told that we can be freed from our fear of death. Now, some translations, when it speaks of death, the King James, I think, is one of them, says that it's the king of terrors. Maybe it says that in your Bible. And why is that? Why is there such a, such a strong fool to be, to be afraid of that? Why is it that something that people don't usually want to talk about at all? Well, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, puts it this way by giving us the answer. He, that's the Lord, has also set eternity in the hearts of men, or the hearts of people. Now, among other people, and among us, what does that mean? It means there's a very potent natural tendency to cling to the things of this world. Will you hear that again? There's a strong natural tendency to cling to the things of this world. Even our humor testifies to this truth. You know what I mean? Someone will come up to somebody and say, you know, I've got good news and bad news about heaven. The good news is there's baseball in heaven, but the bad news is you're pitching on Tuesday. You ever hear something like that? I never thought I'd ever quote Woody, Woody Allen in a sermon, but let me quote his words because I want to drive home a truth. Woody Allen was once asked, what do you want people to say about you in 100 years? And without a moment's hesitation, he responded, I don't know what they're going to say, but I sure hope they say he sure does look good for his age. Makes sense to me. Can we talk? Can we go deep? 
Can we go real deep? Can we go beyond just the surface? Can we sort of turn off the world for a little and turn on Christ a whole lot more? I believe that it's fair and it's accurate to say this same tendency of clinging to the things of this world doesn't just show itself outside of Christian circles, but sometimes inside of Christian circles too. When I was a boy, we used to always sing various songs like, When We All Get to Heaven. You remember that song, When We All Get to Heaven, We'll Shout the Victory, When We All See Jesus, and it was just a wonderful song to sing. But today, most of the music that's been written isn't talking so much about heaven as it's focusing on here and now, and it's all good, and it's all helpful, but it's important to every once in a while be reminded of where we're going to be forever. And what's true sometimes in our music is also true in our books. Go into a Christian bookstore. Or get a catalog of a Christian place that sells books, like CBD or something like that. And when you do, you know what you'll see? That the same thing is going on. Even from our pulpits, there's not much talk about heaven. Instead of focusing on the eternal, what's the focus that so many times we deal with? The focus is overcoming the things of this world. You might say, well, Pastor Ron, that's what you've been talking about for the last, like, two months. You're right. But why did I talk about that? so that we can go into heaven in a stronger way. Hear my heart, but far more importantly than hearing my heart, hear biblical truth. The best way to position oneself to be an overcomer in this world is to be sure and certain of eternity. Will you hear that again? The best way to overcome the things in this world is to be sure sure of the, and certain of eternity. For much of our lives, we don't like to think about death. Much less talk about death. An ancient king, true story, an ancient king one time put out an edict that no one could use the word death in his presence. Somehow he thought if no one used the word death in his presence that he would not experience it. But guess what? He did. Yet truth be told, whether we want to think about it, talk about it, or even ponder it for a little while, we are increasingly reminded of our own mortality. You know what I mean? It, reve it reveals itself in our bodies as we see the effect of aging. I look in the mirror and think, who is this guy who's following me all around? How come I can't run anymore? Or if I run, I'm not going any faster than I did when I walk. What's up with that? How come I got a pain here and I got a pain here and a pain here and sometimes I got a pain here? What's going on with that? Sometimes it comes as we get a little bit older when we can't do some of the things we used to do and we don't even want to try doing some of the things we used to do. Sometimes, sometimes we think a whole lot more about death when someone who we so desperately love and so desperately know leaves this world. Sometimes it comes when we're driving down the street and we're driving down the street and all of a sudden, what do we hear? We hear a siren. And we hear that siren, we've heard a lot of sirens in our day, but when we hear a siren at this particular time, we start thinking, boy, wonder what happened to that person. I wonder if they died. Sometimes we think about death a little bit more when we have a pain we've never had before. I think that's unusual. I better look this up on the internet, not a good idea. Um, and we start thinking about heaven a little bit more. Sometimes we hear it just when we look over and we see a hospital and we look at it, we've seen that hospital a zillion times, but all of a sudden now it's got our attention. Most of the time, the reminders that we're gonna die someday come in a flash, but there are instances that are far too powerful to be ignored. What do we do then? What do we do when what we're facing is too strong for us to ignore biblical truth? Well, let me share with you very openly and very honestly, as a pastor of many years, I have been in the presence of death many times. I've been holding people's hands and watched them die, including my own mother, for that, for that fact. And in those moments, there's a lot of things that pass through my mind and my heart and my soul. But one of the first things that passes through my mind is a passage of Scripture. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Go there with me, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Paul is writing. He's writing to a troubled church. Corinth had its good things and it had its divisions. There's no doubt about it. And what does he say? He says, we are confident. What does that mean? He says, we're assured. We're absolutely certain. Well, certain about what? He says, we are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Now, if you have a King James Bible, I like how it says it there, too, because it puts it this way. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Where will you be present if you die and you're a Christian? You'll be with the Lord. I like to say it this way. The moment you've closed your eyes on earth, you open up your eyes in heaven. 
If you've ever been around death, if you've ever been with somebody who's died, you've noticed something very quickly. Every single thing that they once had within them is still in their body. Their blood's still in them. Their organs are still in them. Every single thing that was ever within their body is still there. That is, everything is still there except what turns the whole entire body on. And what is it that turns the body on? It's the soul. And amen to that. Why? Because when a Christian passes from this world, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For how long? Forever and ever. Amen. Now, you know me at this stage because I've taught you about a lot of deeper truth. And you know that when I have a verse that comes into me, especially at a very special time, a lot of times God puts a song in my heart. And don't worry, I'm not going to sing, but I am going to quote a song or two for you. And the first one that comes to my heart is one that probably by all of you know. second one, I'm probably the only one who knows. Listen to the words of the first one, just part of it. My Jesus, my Savior. This is what I'm thinking when I'm there. I'm not saying it out loud. But I'm in the presence of death. If I'm doing a funeral, I'm thinking this. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want the praise, the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all, not some, not most, all, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord or the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll, I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Nothing. No thing compares to the promise I have in you. I don't say those words out loud, but after thinking that first scripture, how can I not think about that particular song? And then if I continue praying, which I always do, even when I'm speaking to you guys, I'm praying at the same time, I think of a second song. Not all the time, but most of the time. It takes me back to my ministerial roots. I don't know if anyone would know. I don't even know, Brother Mark, if you'd know this song or not. It's an, it's an old gospel song. It goes like this. If he needs me in this harvest, help him, break in, break, um, help him gather in the sheaves, I will gladly labor on below. If my work on earth is finished and it's time for me to leave, when he calls me, I'll be glad to go. When he calls me, I will answer, here I am. I am ready if he wants me to die. There's a mansion now awaiting me on high. I am going there by and by. I have made my preparation from this world of separation. I am walking on God's highway. When he calls me, I will fly. I will fly. And he goes, away. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. I love the song, not just because it's four-part harmony, which I like. I love the song, not just because it's first person, which most Southern gospel songs are. I love this song most of all and let me tell you why because it's true because it's true and when I'm in the presence of death when I'm getting ready to do a funeral when I'm standing by a graveside when I'm in a hospital holding somebody's hand where I am wherever I am and someone has passed away these are the things that pass through my mind these are the things that pass through my heart these are the things that I try to cherish and hold deeply within my soul and I'll tell you what else I do I thank the Lord and I praise him that life is not ended here on this world. And I thank the Lord for the life and the impact of the person who's passed on if they're a Christian, knowing full well that what we weave on earth, we will wear in heaven. You ever think about that? Talk about going deep. Talk about being real. Talk about talking straightforwardly. What we weave here on earth, we will wear up in heaven. I also thank the Lord. He has promised to take care of those who know him in a personal life-changing way by taking them to his house. And we were able to cast all of our cares on him when we miss somebody. And why is that? Because these promises are true. The promise is found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. We can cast all of our cares on him. Why? Because he cares for us. The God of all creation. He wants to be with us forever. Who wants people to come and stay at their house forever other than God? That's how much he loves us. And I thank the Lord for this. And believe me, I thank him for this a lot. 
I thank the Lord that those who have gone on to be with Jesus are more alive than they have ever been before. Yes, you've heard me correctly. There have been times I've said that at a funeral and people look at me like I've lost my mind. But that's biblical truth. They are more alive in heaven than ever. Let me tell you what I know about heaven and what you know too if you give it some thought. There are no operating rooms in heaven. Do you know how many times I've sat in the emergency room? How many times I've sat in a, outside of an operating room? There's no operating rooms in heaven. There's no wheelchairs in heaven. Amen to that. There's no cancer centers in heaven. There's no heart equipment in heaven. There's no oxygen tanks up in heaven. There's no insulin in heaven. There isn't even Kleenex up in heaven. At the very moment that we pass from this world, what does the Bible tell us? It tells us that the veil will be ripped down and with far better than 2020 vision, we get to see what it's like to be ushered by angels. Yes, an angel takes you. If you want to talk about that more, we can do it another day. But an angel takes takes you to not just your home, he takes you to your real home, your eternal home. What a blessing, what a promise, some glad and glorious day. We will see and be with the Lord. Think about what will happen when we're with the Lord. We'll be able to meet the apostles. I've been wanting to talk to them for a long time. We'll be able to go up to the prophets. Their job wasn't easy. I'd like to meet them and have a conversation with them. We'll be able to reunite with Christian friends and loved ones. And here's what I see when I think about it. And I ask the Lord sometimes to stretch my vision so I can get more of a vision of it, so I can share it more because it's such an important topic. I see when I think about it and I'm praying about it and I'm working on a sermon, I see those who have gone on before us in the name of Jesus welcoming us as we come in, congratulating us on our arrival. I see them smiling bigger than we ever saw them smile on earth and I see them giving each other high fives and giving them hugs as they shout out, we will never, ever, ever be separated again. How good is that? What a gift is that? And the blessings don't stop there. Listen to Revelation chapter 21, verse 23. I love what John writes. He's seen a lot too. And he says these words, The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it. Why? Look at the next part. For the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb. Who is that? It's Jesus. Is its lamp. Don't pass over those words too quickly. In heaven, there's no, no reason or no need for the sun or the moon because Jesus is there and his presence alone is what lights it all up. On that day, the day we arrive in heaven, you know what we're going to shout? We're going to shout with praise and we're going to shout with gratitude that on earth we made the decision to ask Jesus into our heart. And when we did that, here's what we did beyond just saying it out loud. We filled out an eternal change of address form. Heaven. 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 Even the sound of the word brings comfort, or at least I know it brings comfort to me. And that should not surprise us. And let me tell you why. Because heaven is a real place. Don't let anybody tell you different. Heaven is a real place. Heaven is not a shadowy, dreamy, intangible, indefinable something somewhere. Heaven is not simply a mere state or condition. It is a real place. It has form. It has a location. It's tangible and it's substantial. Let me tell you something about heaven. It can be touched. It can be seen. It can be possessed. It can be enjoyed. Heaven is not an abstraction but an entity. The home of God where the triune God, the holy angels, and those who have responded by faith in Jesus Christ are with him forever. Jesus himself said these words in John chapter 14. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If, if, if it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. If you're a Christian, you can put your name in that sentence and say amen. And oh, what a place it must be. Look with me at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. We're right under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit in describing heaven. The Apostle Paul tells us some words, and I love these words. He says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I've got to slow down a little bit because I feel like my heart's going 1,000 miles per hour. Probably my words are 10,000 miles per hour. I don't know. But let me share with you this. I've lived for a while. I'm closer to 70 than I am 60. And let me tell you this. I've seen beautiful sights in my life. And I'm sure you have too. 
I remember when I lived in New Mexico, I just couldn't wait to come to Ocean City. And one of the things I wanted to see beyond just my family is I wanted to go to the 9th Street and I wanted to walk up that ramp because when I walked up that ramp, all of a sudden the ocean came in view. And I had been in the desert for such a long time. And when I saw the ocean, it was raining. It touched me in such a wonderful way. I've had a blessing to be able to see a lot of different places in New Mexico. Less than a couple miles from my house was a huge mountain. Even where we were, we were above one mile high where we lived, but the mountain was much higher than that. I've seen beautiful sunrises and I've seen beautiful sunsets, but nothing I've ever seen, and respectively, nothing you've ever seen or nothing we've even all seen together can compare with the majesty we will see someday in heaven. I've heard beautiful words. I've been blessed to have heard beautiful words in my life. I've heard music that so powerfully moved my heart. I just knew right then the Lord was going to say, I'm taking you out now. Sometimes in this room, I felt like I'm just going to just go right through the roof and all of us are going to be going up together because we've heard such beautiful music and that's a wonderful thing. I have heard some very tender words. I've been with couples and I'm doing a marriage. And they're whispering things to each other, and I hear that, and it just blesses me to hear, I love you, can't believe we're actually here, but we're here, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, I'm so glad this day has finally come. No one else hears it, but I get to hear it, and I say amen to that. I've heard the cries of newborn babies to people sometimes who were told they could never have a child, and all of a sudden they have a child. And if you think they're out of control, I've heard the exhilaration that comes from a new grandmother or a new grandfather, especially a new grandmother. Talk about a blessing. Talk about the blessing. And let me share with you something else. On more than one occasion, a number of occasions, I've had the privilege of being with people who struggled near the end of their life. Physically struggled to do what? To offer one more expression of love and tenderness. How do you see all those things and not be marked by them? How do you see all those things and just try to ignore them? I don't. I hold these things deeply within my heart. But know this, no word, no song, can even begin to prepare for what we will be experiencing one day if we go to heaven. Those things being true, and they are, it's so easy to see why the Apostle Paul wrote, no human mind can even begin to imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. No, we can't put the whole thing together. But be assured of this, we can know a lot more about heaven and everything else in God's word if we really make it a choice to do that, and amen to that. What are you saying, Pastor Ron? I'm saying we may not be able to put the whole thing together, but we certainly can get a glimpse. Look back with me at how the apostle drives home this truth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. He, he says, however, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has, has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now there's a pause there. Notice there's a comma there. Notice there's another word. It's, changed. it's changing it around a little bit. But, but what? But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Now, what do we know about heaven if we've read God's Word? What can we be sure of of heaven if we've got God's Word? Well, let me address that for a little while. Feeble hands and knees will be strengthened. You live a little longer, hands don't open up quite as much. They're not as good with your hands, even if you were great with your hands at one time. You live a little longer, and all of a sudden your knees become a little less steady, and you find yourself a lot of times sort of rocking and rolling a little bit, and they're going to be strengthened. Fearful hearts, you ever been afraid? Sure you have, and so have I. But fearful hearts will be made strong. People who are blind, all of a sudden they're able to see. And people who are deaf, all of a sudden their deafness is gone. The lame will be able to leap, amen to that. And those who can't speak will be able to shout. What does the Bible tell us will be taken? In place when we get up in heaven it tells us there will be singing there will be gladness and joy as sorrow and even sighing what's that that oh won't just go away what will it do it will flee away it will go away so quickly the apostle john tells us in the book of the revelation chapter 21 verse 1 that there will no longer be a sea or a separation he tells us that the home of god will be dressed like a beautiful bride and a loud voice from the throne will welcome his children where welcome his children home in fact the scripture tells us that one of the things that takes place when we first get to heaven is he's going to wipe away every tear from our eye now, there's a lot of ways to look at that wouldn't be the heaven we know if God didn't wipe away the tears. And some people say, well, I'll never cry in heaven. Well, I don't agree with that. 
I think when we get to heaven and we see the majesty of Jesus and we see the perfection of heaven and we see that it's a gift that he's given us, I think we're going to cry a lot because I think we're going to recognize we could have been so much more in our life. And I believe if God didn't wipe away the tears, we'd be crying for an awfully long time. What do we know about heaven? There'll be no more death. I'm anxious for that time. There'll be no more mourning. Boy, have I been with a lot of people over the years. There'll be no more crying. Boy, I've cried, cry me a river. You gotta be kidding me, I've cried oceans. There'll be no more pain of any kind. Emotion, physical pain, spiritual pain, all those things, the old order of things will be passed away. Those things are so true that John wants us to make sure we're taking them to heart. And when John is talking to the Lord, I think he's saying, Lord, this vision that you're giving me is so miraculous. This vision that you're giving me is so powerful. I love hearing it, but am I getting ahead of myself? Am, am, am I thinking more than what I ought to? And so I'm not surprised that John was, read, was led to write these words in that same section. He said, write these things down, John, for these words are trustworthy and these words are it's wonderful to read about streets of gold. It'd be an interesting thing to see. It's wonderful to read about precious jewels. You read in the book of the Revelation about all these beautiful precious jewels, some of which we don't even look like. It's wonderful to read about precious stones. But can you imagine what it'd be like to be with someone who you knew the whole time on earth and they were blind and they never could see anything and the first thing that they saw was Jesus. Can you imagine what that would be like? Remember, Franny Crosby used to say that. They used to say, don't you wish that God would take your blindness away? And she said, no, because the first thing I want to see is I want to see Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be like to be with someone who their whole life they never were able to hear anything? I've been with people before who've had that. They never heard anything, and then all of a sudden their ears are going to stop. And what's the first thing that they hear? They hear the voices of angels, or they hear Jesus saying, welcome home. I had a really good friend. In New Mexico, went to church with me for a very long time. He battled with all kinds of illnesses, and he really had a terrible battle with Parkinson's. I remember he would come into church really early. It would take him such a long time just to be able to walk in the door. He'd be exhausted when he sat down, and then he would always wait until almost everyone left because he didn't want anyone to feel awkward when he tried to make his way out because it took every ounce of energy that he had. And I'm sure that on Monday, and probably Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, he probably didn't go anywhere because he exerted so much of his energy when he came to church. And I remember his wife called me and she said, I think my husband's going to pass away. And I went over there and spent some time with him. And the guy who led the music came with me. And as we were sitting there praying and talking, all of a sudden she said, well, you guys know the Bible pretty well. Can you take turns telling me something new about heaven? And we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And the guy who I was with was a lot smarter than me. But this is a subject I really have studied. And I'll tell you what, it, was, it turned out to be a beautiful night, even it was a very painful night. And when I went back to my car, it was late at night, by myself. And I drove home in the dark. And I'll tell you what I had. I had a vision of watching him run up and down the streets of heaven. Run up and down the streets of heaven. I could tell you so many stories about being with people, hearing precious words and comforting words of affirmation. I could tell you so many stories that have happened even in the last year or two here let me, let me segue on that for a minute. There's a man who's a friend of mine here that many of you know. I won't say his name. He doesn't come to heaven, Lord. He pops in from time to time. He goes to a different church. We've been friends a long time. He took care of his wife so well, it was amazing to me. He called me like three weekends in a row and said to me, I just believe my wife's going to pass away. He called me on Saturday and she's going to pass away tonight. This is not that long ago. And I said, well, then why don't I come over right now? And he'd say, no, you don't need to come over right now. In fact, I'd appreciate if you just wait and you come by my house tomorrow after church. Are you sure? I said, I can drive in the dark. It's not a problem. I practice driving in the dark. It's not a problem. No, just come tomorrow after church. So three weeks in a row, I stopped at his house the first time. She hadn't died. Stopped at his house the second time. She hadn't died. Third time I stopped at his house, she had died. Let me tell you what I saw the first and second time. Her eyes couldn't be opened. She hadn't talked for months. 
she had shown no sign of life aside from her body having some breathing. But let me tell you what happened all of a sudden after they prayed. She opened her eyes. This is true. And she blew her husband a kiss. And then she went to heaven. Hello. Hello. Let me give you another example that I will never forget. It's the first time I was with somebody who had pancreatic cancer. My mom later had it just a few years later. She struggled, and boy did her husband try to take care of her. I visited with him once or twice a week because it was such a hard thing, and there's no doubt about it. And months before she passed away, her eyes were shut, and her mouth needed to be opened by her husband because he would swab inside her mouth so that she would still have some not so dry mouth and he would then take care of her eyes and just try to wipe her eyes as much as he could. I visited him the same days almost all the time of the week. But one day he called me on the phone and he said, I know you don't typically come today, Pastor, but I wonder if you could come today. And it happened to be that not only I got to come that day, but Stephanie was not working then. Um, it was, she was a teacher back in those days, but she had the day off and so we went there together. We were together for hours. For hours we were together. Just like the other times, we talked about the Lord, we talked about the Bible, we prayed, we did all these other things, but then we just sat quietly. It just seemed like it was time to be quiet. It seemed like it was quiet for him and it seemed to be quiet for me. I don't know how much time went by, but it seemed like forever, but that probably wasn't more than like 15 or maybe 20 minutes. When all of a sudden I watched him get out of his chair, I was sitting right beside him. And when he got out of his chair, he walked over to her side he grabbed her by the hand and got on his knees. I wasn't about to say anything, but I'll tell you what I did. I did the same thing. Didn't say one word. I got out of my chair. I went over beside her and grabbed her other hand. And when we both got there and we were both on our knees, he prayed. And he prayed, Lord, if it's your willingness, if it's your will to take her home, she's ready. And so am I. Picture seeing this. And I prayed the same kind of prayer, saying very similar words. If you know much about me, you know I don't have the best vision, and when I really try to concentrate on something, or I'm really praying diligently, if you don't see me when I'm in back, I take off my glasses when I pray. I take off my glasses when I'm getting, when I'm praying from up here. But you know what, that day, that happened so quickly, I wasn't able to take off my glasses, and I'm so very glad, and let me tell you why. Because at the very moment he said, amen. Stephanie was there too. I was beside her, he was beside her. Stephanie was on the other side, so she saw even more than what I did because I had a side view and she had a front view. As Soon as he said, amen, her eyes, which had been sealed for months, all of a sudden opened. Let me tell how wide they opened. I don't think it's possible to make your eyes that wide open by your, like I'm trying to make my eyes real open right now. I don't think it's possible to make your eyes that wide open in your own strength. And then let me tell you what else I saw. I saw with my own eyes and said to Stephanie, her face that had been sealed for days burst forth with the most beautiful smile I have ever seen. And then she passed away. And let me tell you, I'll tell you what she saw. She had a picture of heaven. Do you know how many times I've been with people who know that they're going to be passing away soon and they'll say, I don't watch the news anymore. I don't read the paper anymore. I don't get involved in all this trivia anymore. I'm trying to focus on heaven. My thoughts are no longer in this world. I'm being pulled toward heaven. Now think with me. Think with your mind. Think with your heart. Think with your soul. Think with your spirit or anything else I can think of to say to you. Think about what heaven will be like. The curse will be lifted. Boy, am I ready to see that happen. The impaired will be healed. Amen to that. The reunion of all reunions will take place. I'm going to Jesus first because he's the one that opened the door and made all this possible, but I got a lot of people I'm going to be running to after that to give them the hug. Here's what I see in my mind's eye. I see hugs and I see high, high fives. In my mind's ear, I hear loved ones saying to each other, I sure have missed you, but we will never, ever be apart. What's that worth? What's that worth? Why are we so invested on earth, but not more invested in heaven? 
All these things are tremendous, but let me tell you about the most tremendous thing about heaven, is we'll be with the Lord himself. I've been reading about him every day for close to 50 years. I've been singing about him so many different days of the week when I was going to Bible study and going to church and going to conferences. But you know what the Bible tells us is going to happen? Someday when we go to heaven, we're going to see him face to face. And when John is writing the book of the Revelation, he knows all the turmoil that's going to be there. And if you read it now, you see so many things that he said were going to happen are actually happening right now. What does he say? You read it in the God's Word. It says, come Lord Jesus. And why does he say that? Because heaven is a real place. It's my prayer that you'll be there. And it's my prayer that you will genuinely get to know the Lord before you get there. Isn't it better when you're really good friends with somebody when you come into their house rather than trying to meet them on your way in? It's my prayer that we'll put our true treasure there and we'll have our eyes fixed there even while our feet are still here on earth. And before we close, I want you to look at one more passage of Scripture with me. Go to the book of Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse 1 and 2. Paul is writing again. He's in prison when he writes these words. It's amazing how many things he went through. Look what he says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3 of Colossians. He says, since then, since you became a Christian, you have been raised with Christ, set, fix, whatever your translation would see, what? Your hearts on or seek the things that are above. Where is that? Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, some translations say, your hearts on things that are above, not on earthly things. Now, I studied this a little bit more than what maybe the average person would because it's such an important subject to me. So I looked up the original translation in the Greek, and you see that there's a, in the English, you see the word mind or you see the word heart. It comes from the Greek term zito. It refers to a purposeful or intentional search or quest. It's the same word that's used in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where Jesus talked about seeking the lost. It's the same word that's used in Matthew chapter 10, verse 12, where it talks about how a shepherd is looking for a lost sheep. It's the same word that's used in Luke chapter 15, verse 18, where it talks about a woman who's searching for a lost coin. It's the same word that's used in Matthew chapter 13, verse 45, when a merchant is searching for a lost pearl. Therefore, what are we to learn from these words and what are we to learn from these passages? We are to diligently, we are to diligently do what? We're to diligently pursue what is above. And this verb, if you notice, is in the present tense. What does that mean? We are to keep on doing it, keep on doing it, keep on doing it until the day we go home. It's not enough to just have a conversation. It's not enough to just read a book. It's not enough to just hear a sermon. We are to make the pursuit of Christ and His kingdom the primary purpose of our lives. And you know what? If we do that, not only we have the beauty of heaven, we have so much better life here on earth. We get the best of both worlds. I'm a great believer. But what John wrote in John 10.10 10 is so true that Jesus came to give us not just eternal life, but abundant life. But for us to have that come true for us, what does the Bible teach? We must see first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then everything else will be added to us. It's not going to come when we just give Him a little. It's going to come when we give Him our all. For you see, the Bible tells us something very different about death than what the world tells us. Listen to a verse you'll probably only hear if you're in a funeral. I'm glad you're hearing it today in a church service. It's Psalms chapter 116, verse 15. It declares, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Hello. Can you hear that again? Precious. I call my little granddaughter Precious. It's better <laughs> than Katie with my princess. She's my precious. Precious means dearly loved. Precious what? Precious is the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. And why is that? I'll tell you why. Because the moment we close our eyes on earth, if we're a believer, we'll find the ultimate healing taking place. As we go where? As we go home. As we go to our real home. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. It's a gift he's given us. I can't wait to get there. I have a book. After being in the ministry for so long, 
I decided a long time ago I needed to have a little book that I worked on for my family. And in this little book, it says, if, you know, if you need the insurance man, here's his name and his telephone number. If you need the, um, you know, somebody to talk to about money, you can talk to this person. If you need somebody that can help you with fixed things, it's, you can talk to this person, have all those names and numbers. And here's our bank accounts and what they're listed. And here's our checkbook and all that crazy stuff. And then here's a few things about me when I was a boy. And so if you want to have some thoughts that you want to say at some point, maybe you knew them, maybe you didn't, there's all that. I'll tell you what's at the end of that book. At the end of that book, I have bullet point after bullet point after bullet point of conviction because I'm serious about God with every fiber of my being. I'm a goofball in a lot of ways, but with every fiber of my being, I am serious about God. And let me tell you what's in the front of that book. It says these words or something very close to it. If you're opening this book, you know that I am where you've heard me talk about so many times. And I'm glad to be there. Heaven's my real home. Meet the Savior. Don't just take from him. Live for him. Give him your all. And watch what he will do. I have seen it so many, many times times, not just when people are dying, but when people are living. And then also, one last piece, I've been with a lot of people who, when everybody's out of the room but me, and it's not because I'm special, it's just probably because of the work I do, so I just got to tell you, I sure wish I had been a little bit more. Sure wish I'd gone a little bit further. Sure wish I had lived a little bit more of a righteous life. I sure wish I had gotten to know Jesus more. What are you going to say then? Well, I say, the Lord's going to accept you. It's not based on works. But you know what? When I get to heaven, I pray that the Lord will say, you did your best. Mm -hmm. Stephanie said to me one day, last word. I can speak forever on this. Stephanie said to me one day, if we ever got you a tombstone, what would you want written on it? I said, you know, Stephanie, I never even thought about anything like that. Whether people remember me, that's not important to me. I hope that they would remember that I'm a Jesus man. But she said to me, seriously, what would you want written on it? And I said, not much. She said, well, how many words would you want? I said, two. She said, really? And I said, I'd want the words, I tried. And I want those words to be true. And if you see them not being true in my life, call me on them. And if you want those words to be true for you, Invite others, including me, to call you on it. We're talking about eternity. We're talking about Jesus face to face. We're talking about a reunion. We're talking about our real home. Our home in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we read books sometimes about heaven, and then we find out later on that somebody made them up just to make a movie or to sell a book. Father, may we read the book that we can depend on, the book that answers so many of our questions, the book that strengthens our spirits and convicts our hearts. Father, we know that we live in a world where people are afraid of a lot of things, but Father, when they live in you, you tell them that you've not given them the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But our oh Lord, our minds aren't gonna be sound if we're not in your word. Our minds aren't going to be sound if we're not with your people. Our words are not going to be sound if we're not continuing to grow. Our words, are words that we say to ourselves are not going to be sound words if we're not using our spiritual gift. Father, the evil one in our own human spirit wants so many times to be muted. You want us to speak out. You want us to reach out. You want us to share. You want us to have not only an abundant life, but an eternal life. And someday we'll be with you in heaven. And may we make it our utmost goal to walk in strong. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.